Jonathan, Pastor Sean is going to come out and share an incredible message about our risen King. Awesome, awesome. Wait, hey, we're going to get started real soon. We're going to come back out and speak to you a little bit later. But for now, turn to the person next to you. Turn to the person you came with and ask them, what is your favorite Easter memory?
Good morning. We are so glad that you guys chose to spend Easter here at Vail Church. We know there's a ton of places that you could be. You could be in an egg hunt. You could be at brunch. You could be doing both. I don't know. But we are so glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend right here at Vail. And if you're online, we are so happy that you're joining us here too. In just a few moments, the band is going to come out and join us on stage. And we're going to start off service by worshiping together. If you want to sing along, which we highly encourage you to, you can do so by following along on the screens. After that, we're going to hear what's happening in the life of Vail, and then Pastor Sean is going to come out and share an incredible message about our risen king. I think that's all I have for you, so we're going to get started in just about two minutes.
welcome to Bill Church. We're so glad you're here. We know there's a lot of places you could be this weekend, and the fact that you chose to spend some of your time with us means the world to us. Here's what we know. We have an empty tomb. We have a king that is sitting on a throne who's risen and he reigns. So we're going to sing out together. We'll lift our eyes. We won't feel the fire. There is one who's strong. Pressed on each side, we will not lose of the world is great. One day, one day was every victory. One voice that silences the enemy. One king.
friends run and flee at the mention of your name, King of Majesty. The mountain shape before the team is run. King, we get to worship today. We are so excited to see how God continues to show up this weekend, and we are glad that you are here to experience that with us. Would you all take a moment to pray with me? God, we thank you so much for being a God that allows us to worship him. God, thank you for being a God that loves us so much that you sent your son to live for us, to die for us, and then to conquer sin and death for us. We thank you. We love you. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. And you all can go ahead and have a seat. And today we are excited because we get to celebrate the greatest victory ever, a victory that you and I have because of who Jesus is and what he has done for every single one of us. We have a king who loves us more than we will ever understand. And it is because of that that we get to worship and celebrate today. As we continue to celebrate, I want to invite you to listen to Hillary's story about when she met her king. My name is Hillary Pacia, and I've called Vail home for nearly 19 years. Vail changed my life because when I walked through those doors for the first time, I only knew about God through rules. But this is where I learned about relationships. And it was through those Christ-centered connections, through things like sisterhood or joining a small group for the first time, even though that's scary, I found life wasn't meant to be alone and done alone. And so it was through that I found that support. And I even started leading a small group because of it, because I knew how intentional connection was so key to my relationship with Jesus. And then there was Rooted. That was by far the most impactful thing that I've done here at Vail. We're always talking about next steps, and I didn't know what my next steps were. And then when Rooted came along, I knew that's where I belong. Because of Rooted, I started fostering children, 
and even in February 2020, I started a nonprofit called One Hope Project, and that's helping people right here in our community who are battling eating disorders. I'm so thankful for all that Vail has offered here and, and ways to take next steps and get in community. But man, real life transformation happened for me when I made Jesus the king of my life. That's when everything changed. Uh, well, once again, welcome everybody. My name is Corey. I've got the privilege of serving on the team here at Vail. It is so good to see you guys in the room. Those of you joining us online, it is great to have you guys with us. A special shout out and welcome to our first time guests. Can we give it up for them? We are so glad that you're here with us this weekend. If you are visiting with us, I want to ask you if you can get your phone out, text the word NEXT to 309-777-0677. We would love to be able to connect with you sometime this week. If you're in the room and you've got elementary age or younger kids, I want to make sure you know about Vail Kids. Every weekend, every service, Vail Kids creates a fun and safe environment where your kid gets to learn about the love of Jesus in an incredible way. And so if they're in the room with you, you can still head across the lobby, check them in. They're going to have a great time in their class. They get to do an egg hunt. It's going to be a great time for them. But adults, we got some stuff for you too. I want to let you know about two connection opportunities we've got coming up. Our next men's event is happening on Tuesday, April 9th. And so all guys, high school age and up, we're going to head out to Gill Street. We're going to eat some food, throw some axes, and have a great time with that. And ladies, our next sisterhood event is happening on Friday, May 3rd. And you can learn more about both of those events and register for those by going to our website, or you can do that through the app as well. As we get ready for our message today, I want to give you 30 seconds, turn to some people around you, say hi, give some high fives to answer the question, what is your favorite Easter candy? And Peeps is not an option, okay? 30 seconds on the clock, here we go. All right. Happy Easter, everyone. Who said Reese's eggs? Where are my Reese's eggs people at? There it is. I said Cadbury eggs. It's just that everybody says Reese's eggs. So we're glad that you're here. Happy Easter. Listen, if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. That's something I've always been told, and I'm excited for today. And so my name is Sean Jensen. I have the privilege of serving as a lead pastor here. Now hear me out. This is my fifth time doing this, and so if I say something stupid, just laugh, all right? We are good? All right, cool. Hey, before we continue on, um, I just want to honor some people. Our volunteers have been here throughout the week. They've been here all weekend, overflow, everything happened directing cars, and the worst we had was someone ran over the curb. That is it. So can we thank God for our volunteers and everything they have done this week? What an incredible, incredible week, and we can't wait to tell you everything God has done, but we're going to jump into the message today. Um, oh, I'm going to have to make you clap one more time because we got people joining us online. Come on, say hi. How are you guys? <laughs> Illinois, Missouri, South Oh, do I see Brazil? That is awesome. Texas, California, places that are warmer than here, that's for sure. Um, but we are glad that you're joining us today. And we're going to talk a little bit about why the tomb is empty and why it's important. And really, my goal today is to convince people that, you know, we need a king. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, I picked up my 10-year-old daughter, and I, and I put her in my arms, and I held her like she was 10 weeks old. I was having that moment with her as she's getting older, my oldest daughter. And I was having a moment with her, and I was looking at her in her eyes, and she was looking up at me. And I looked at her, and I said, Avery, this is how I used to carry you when you were a baby. And so as I was connecting with her in her eyes and having this sentimental moment with her, because it might not last long, she looks at me, and I look at her, and she goes, Daddy... I'm not a baby anymore. And I was like, thank you for ruining the moment. And I dropped her, right? Like, I was like, I didn't drop her. I started down nicely. I promise. It's just, I thought about it, but I didn't do it. I promise. 
And she's right. I don't treat her the same way I did as she was a baby. I got to treat her differently. She's getting older. She's got more responsibility. And as I talk about that when it comes to our faith sometimes, I think a lot of times we can kind of treat Jesus like that. Like when we celebrate Christmas, what we're celebrating is baby Jesus. But when we're celebrating Easter, we're celebrating King Jesus. And if I'm honest with you, it's easier to celebrate baby Jesus because we can control baby Jesus, but it's harder to control a king. And we need a king in our life. And so a lot of people have no problem celebrating baby Jesus. But when you have a king who wants to lead your life and give you obedience and give you guidance, sometimes that's a lot harder. But I want to convince you today that having Jesus as king of your life is actually one of the best things we can do. So in that case, that's why we're going to do that today. Now, I want to make sure that you guys know as we continue on with this moment that we're going to look at a scripture in Revelation. Just in case you see baby Jesus in the manger still. Or maybe your picture is Jesus with flowing blonde hair and a purple sash around him. Like if that's the picture of Jesus, let me show you what he really looks like. We're gonna be in the back of the Bible in Revelation, and this is the picture of when Jesus is actually coming back to this earth with his church, all right? So he's coming to establish the kingdom of God, and this is a picture we get of Jesus. Then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there, Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understands except himself, wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses, and from his mouth came sharp swords to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. First off, I'm glad I'm on his team. Anybody else? Like, this is a good thing. Now, if you're here and you're not, we're glad that you're here. But this is the picture we need to see when we talk about Jesus. We're talking about many crowns. We're talking about flame eyes. We're talking about swords out of mouth. Obviously, it's an imagery. But right here, it says king of all lowercase kings and lord of all lowercase lords, which means in our life, there's going to be things that try to take lordship. In our life, there's going to be things that try to take kingship. But the truth of the matter is, is Jesus wants to set the record straight. He will always be king of kings, and he will always be lord of all lords. We may agree with that statement or not, but the truth remains. He is king, whether we believe it or not. And I want to convince you today that he is not just king. He is a good king. And if you have not made him king of your life, I'm telling you, it's the best decision you can make. And so I want to convince you that today, but I'm going to need the Holy Spirit's help. I believe in prayer, and so I'm going to ask for his help right now, okay? So let's pray. Holy Spirit, help me. It's number five. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's all we need. So we're going to look. I just got to do what we got to do sometimes, y'all. We're going to look at this Old Testament scripture. Um, In this moment, this is the nation of Israel, the people of God. And God has led them and protected them and guided them. Sometimes they rebel against God. Most of the time they rebel against God, but he's been faithful to them. And so he's the king of their life. But in this moment, God would actually raise up judges and prophets to lead his people. That's how he guided them. That's how he corrected them. That's how he would speak to them. And so he would use these people to do that. Now, in this scripture, we're going to look in the book of Samuel. He was a prophet by God. And in this moment, the nation of Israel rejects rejects God as king. And here's what happens. It says this in 1 Samuel 8 through 5. Look, they told him, you are now old. That's not a very good way to start a sentence to your prophet, by the way. Like, don't try that with your boss this week. Listen, man, you're old, all right? And your sons, I love this, they're not like you, meaning I don't want them to become prophet either. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with the request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continued to abandon me and filed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask. I love this. But they solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So in this moment, in the request for an earthly king, they have now rejected a heavenly king. They had no idea that we were rejecting God. They didn't know they were already in the best hands. Isn't that just like us sometimes, to forget that God has actually got us to the place we are today? They forgot that it was God who 
set them free from Egypt and slavery. It was God who delivered them from their enemies. It was God who provided for them in the desert and the wilderness when they had no food. It was God who guided them when they were confused and needed clarity. It was God who produced light in the middle of the darkness. It was God who brought them into a land that they could settle where they could have family and he delivered them from all of their enemies and has protected them. And when they rebelled, he even would come back and he would relent and his love was gracious to them. He was king. And they rejected him. And they said, we want a king like every other nation. In this moment, they rejected the best king. They wanted a knockoff king. They wanted a king from Timu. That's what they wanted. (laughs) What if we are rejecting the best king, and then so we are settling for a knockoff king? What if in our life that we've convinced ourselves the thing that's ruling our life right now is the best thing, but really it's a knockoff? It looks real, but it's a cheap imitation. It's going to fall apart. What if that's the case that we have today? Now, I know in 2024, we don't use this type of phrasing very much, kings and kingdoms and queens and rulers, but Jesus came to talk about the kingdom of God, that he has the kingdom of God, and for those who are in Christ, we are a part of that kingdom, and he rules as king. But, but we don't talk like that, and maybe you're here saying, what does that mean? It just means I'm asking, who is ruling our life? What do you have as ruler? And you may look and say, you know what, Sean, I really don't want a king, and I really have no desire to have a king. And the sobering truth is no matter if you believe or if you don't believe, if you're coming because you want to be here, or maybe you're checking this out, no matter what, we're glad that you're here. But the truth is, we all have a king if we admit it or not. We all have something ruling our life if if we admit it or not. We all have something that's calling the shots in our life. And this culture, cash is king. Power is king. Sex is king. Success is king, pleasure is king, influence and likes are king, right? Status, it's king. And at the core, if we really want to get there, we are king. We want to be king. We want to rule. We want to make the choices. We want to choose what's right. We want to make sure that whatever feels good is right. And so what we do is we change things and we rule our life thinking it's the best thing and realizing it might just be a knockoff. And then I realize when I rule my life is this, the one who's deceived myself the most, the one who has lied to myself, the one who hurts me the most, and the one who's put me in painful situations the most has been myself. It's been me. I make a lousy ruler. I've realized in my life, it doesn't mean I'm failing my way through. It just means that I realized after time that I can lead myself into some pretty terrible things. But there's Jesus who saw me in the midst of it. Sometimes we're the ones who hurt ourselves the most. So I want to convince you today that maybe, just maybe, Jesus would be a great ruler and king in your life. He would be someone that you could trust and that you could choose today. It's not always going to be easy, but it's always going to be beneficial. So let me just show you a few reasons why I think that. First off, he's a humble king. He is so humble. The humility of Jesus is incredible. Have you ever seen someone or met someone who's allowed power to go to their head? Have you ever met someone who's allowed authority or because they got the promotion or more power, it went to their head and they abused that power? <laughs> I see this every time I ask my 8-year-old to go tell my 10-year-old to get off her tablet. <laughs> like, I'm like, hey, Charlie, can you go tell Avery to go get off her tablet. And she's like, you want me to tell her daddy? (laughs) Like, I've given her power. Like, you would have thought I asked her to be the president of the United States of America. Like, American flag drops behind her, trumpets are going off, rockets and eagles from her brain. Like, it's just like, here we go, right? She walks up the stairs in charge, and all of a sudden I hear, hey, Avery, daddy wants me to tell you, right? You got to use daddy because that's how you got the authority. Daddy wants me to tell you, you need to get off your tablet or he's going to ground you for life and ship you away and never talk to you again. I'm like, I didn't say that, Charlie. She goes, I added it, right? Like, why? Because she's allowed it to go to her head. She wants to use that. And if we're honest, some of us have been hurt because of people in power. Some of us have been a victim and hurt because of people who have taken their authority, it went to their head. Some of us have experienced that in churches. Some of us experienced it from pastors and ministry leaders. And if that's you, I just want to encourage you. That's not who Jesus is, but I would really invite you to come back next week because we are starting a series that I think is going to be awesome for a church called I Love Jesus But Not the Church. And we're going to talk about church hurt and how the church can be better and how we can heal, but also why it's important that the church is still here. 
Now, I'd encourage you to bring some people. I'd encourage you to come. But the reason I bring that up is because some of us are here because someone who abused their power, that's not Jesus. Actually, I would say it's the opposite. When Paul was encouraging the church of Philippi, he actually tells them to look like Jesus. He says, put others' interest above yourself. Don't put yours above theirs. You put theirs above yourself. And he said, be like Jesus. And he goes to tell them what Jesus looks like in Philippians 2. Oh, yeah, he's a humble king. I forgot to, oh, did I tell you that? I forgot to tell you about Abraham. Abraham Lincoln said nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to see a man's character, give him power. This is true with women, too. Nearly all men and women can stand adversity, but if you want to test a woman or man's character, give them power. I love this. Abraham Lincoln, who used his presidential authority, what did he do? He abolished slavery. He made America a better place. Why? Because he realized his power, his presidential power, would be used for good when others use it for harm. But Philippians, let's go back to what Jesus looks like. It says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. First things we gotta show, show you, he was God. This is a bold statement. Paul wants to be very clear. Jesus is who he says he was. He was not just a man who walked this earth. He was also fully God. He was God who put on skin and bone and dwelt among us. This is important because there's even secular historians today that say they're atheists or agnostic, but there was a man named Jesus who walked this earth based on historical documents. The issue that people deal with is they don't believe he was fully God. But we believe the tomb is empty. We believe that Jesus did not just say he was man of God, or he was a son of man, he was also the son of God. And when he said that he would die and rise again, he died and he rose again. And so he's God, which means he has a lot of authority. That's a lot of power. And he could use that any way he wanted. So let's see how he used it. He gave up his privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. You're telling me Jesus could have destroyed every single person who was putting him on that cross. You're telling me Jesus could have built his kingdom while he was here on earth. He could have overturned Rome. He could have done whatever he wanted. You're telling me Jesus could have escaped the hands of those who arrested him in the garden before he went to the cross. Jesus could have pulled himself off that cross when he was hurting. Jesus could have got down any time, but instead, what did he do? He stayed up on that cross, and he died a criminal's death. And that criminal wasn't him. That criminal was us. He used his authority not to pull himself off the cross. No, he used the authority to keep himself on the cross Amen. for you and for I. That's how he used his authority. That's a humble king. He thought about you until his last breath, and he's still thinking about you today. Why does he make a good king? Because he came and lived a human experience. He came down into this earth and he lived among us. He left heaven and he came to this hurting and broken world full of pain and suffering and he washed feet and he served people and he healed the blind and he preached the gospel and he took care of the widows and the orphans and he did these things because he used his power to serve. He understands you and he knows how to walk alongside of you. He's a humble king, but don't get it twisted. He might be a humble king, but he's also a victorious king. It was his humility that actually led to victory. His humility. You want to find victory in your life? Learn how to humble yourself before a mighty God. He was humble, but he was also victorious. He came in a manger, but now he's sitting on the throne. He came into Jerusalem riding a donkey's colt, but now he's coming back on a white horse. He went to the cross and he died and took his final breath, but the grave is empty three days later. He is ascended up into heaven and he sits at the right hand of his father and he still prays for us and he still cheers for us and he still loves us and he gives us his spirit as well. He is victorious. And now that he is sitting with his father in heaven, let me just give you a picture of what this looks like. Isaiah says, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. You guys catching this? God's using us as an ottoman. <laughs> I wish I could show you. Like, that's, that's what I want to do after five right now, right? I want to go home and just kick up. He's kicking up, relaxing. Get this picture. He's relaxing. He is rested. There's nothing to be bent out of shape about. Why? Because Jesus finished the work. So everything in our world, get this idea, everything that we face, 
the wars, the violence, the pain, the suffering, the election season, everything in between, the hate, the hatred, the discord, the things that keep us up at night, the sickness, the death, all of it. God's resting on it. He's resting on what we're worried about. He's laid back saying, you don't have to be out of shape because I am king. My kingdom goes beyond this world. My kingdom goes beyond this place. See, what he's trying to say is that, no, there's a lot of people who actually don't join following Christ because of stuff like this. Because they think this scripture says that your God is far off. And he doesn't care about the pain and suffering that's in this world. And so he's just sitting back. But that's so far from the truth. Because we see scripture, how he's so focused on what happens in this world. That's actually why he started the church. Have you thought about this? If Jesus was done with you when you came to Christ, he would have had you in heaven by now. But he left you here for some reason. Because he knows your story is going to set someone else free. Because he knows that he's going to use the church to help with people who are hurting and broken. So when we say stuff like, oh, God is so far off, he's not concerned about this world, don't blame God for what the church is supposed to do. We are supposed to rise up. We are supposed to help those who are hurting. We are supposed to do those missions. We are supposed to look for the poverty and give them the gospel. We are called to actually serve those around us. And the church has been doing that. That's why we have hospitals. That's why we have wealth, wealth care uh, organizations. That's why we have universities. Did you know that started from the church? That is God's answer to this world. But this scripture is not about that as much as it's about a posture that no matter what we go in this life, because Jesus overcame it all, we overcome as well. He's saying, I know it's tough sometimes. I know it's hard. I know you might be going through college or school and everything seems so big and I get that. But when you see how big it is, just remember your God, his feet are resting on it. He's got this. And even when death comes into this world, he says, my kingdom goes beyond this world. Jesus told his disciples this. He tried to encourage them before he went to the cross. The last supper, the last things he's telling his disciples, he mentions something like this. John 16, the disciple John tells us, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But in this world, you will have trouble. I don't like that verse. Anybody else? I wish that when we made King Jesus, like Jesus King, it's like, and no more pain. And no more trouble. You're going to coast through this life and nothing's ever going to touch you. It's going to be great. I wish it said, and you won't have trouble anymore. That seems like a faith I can get behind. But hold on. The reason I make Jesus king is not so I won't have trouble. The reason I make Jesus king is to invite him into my trouble. The reason I make Jesus king is not because I'm not going to walk through trial. The reason I have a faith and I make Jesus king is because I need him in my trial. I need him in my battles. I need him in my suffering. I need him in my pain. I need him when I was in the darkest season of my life to shine light in what I'm going through. I don't have a faith that keeps me out of trouble. I have a faith that helps me overcome my trouble. That's what Jesus came to do, to conquer cross and the grave. That's who he is. And, and, and I'm passionate about this. So if you're new here and you're like, why is he yelling at me? I promise I'm not yelling at you. It's just changed my life. It's changed my life. When I made Jesus king of my life when I was 19, I wish, we can argue scripture all day, but you can't, ex you can't argue the experiences I've had. And here's why. Because he's been with me in trouble. And he says, when you have trouble, take heart. Why can we take heart in trouble? Because Jesus conquered it all. So we can either be overcome by the world or with Christ, we can overcome the world. He says, I conquered sin, I conquered death, and I conquered the grave. And Paul says, oh, grave, oh, death, where is your sting? It is swallowed up in victory. If you don't like when people say the best is yet to come, I'm here to tell you, Paul himself said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. AKA, the best is yet to come. That even when we leave this earth, we are still going into a kingdom that the best is yet to come. He lived with that anticipation in the middle of trial, in the middle of suffering, in the middle of the jail sentences, Paul lived this way. And he could. And he knew what this looked like to overcome. And if you're here and you need to overcome, Jesus wants us to have victory in our life. And Paul understands that. And that's why he wrote to the churches in Rome. And he said this very same thing Jesus said. He said, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I'm convinced, now I can hear my grandfather, he's a preacher that used to grow up in the church. I can hear him start rumbling his throat right there. He'd be like, and I'm convinced, and the church starts riling up. I'm not gonna do that, but I just have a picture of it. I can't do it like him. That neither death nor life, and somebody, and life, right? Like I'm like, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, I love this, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's like you will never be separated from the love of God. The love that was displayed on the cross will never separate you. The love that God has for you, you can never be separated from it. It's a deep love. But let's go back to we are more than conquerors. That's what we're talking about here. Paul says you are more than conquerors. Okay, so Jesus is the conqueror. He conquered sin, death, and the grave, and now he's victorious. He rose again by the Holy Spirit's power, which makes him a conqueror. A good king is a conqueror. A good king has territory. A good king has a kingdom. And when you're in Christ, you have access to that kingdom. Jesus is a conqueror. But Paul says something else. He goes, but we are more than that. What? Can you say that, Paul? We are more than Jesus? That's not what he's saying. We are more than conquerors. This word conquerors in the Greek is the word nikeo. Now, sometimes I use the Greek just to impress you because I'm so smart. That's not why I did it. The reason why I did it is I only use it if it actually makes sense. Look at Nikeo is where we get the word Nike. It means victory. That's what Nike comes from. So you remember that when you see your shoe. Paul says Nikeo. Jesus is Nikeo. He's a conqueror. But he adds this Greek word to it. When you add these two Greek words together, he says hyper Nikeo. Hyper means super, powerful, super conquerors. How can we be super conquerors, Paul? Imagine this. A boxer has a family. He's married. they got kids. He's going into the fight of his life. The reward is $10 million. It's a $10 million purse. That's what he's going to take home if he wins. His wife is too scared to go to the fight, so she stays home and she watches from her TV. The kids are doing whatever they're doing, and he gets into the ring and it starts. They start fighting. He takes blows to the face. He gets punched in the gut. He's bleeding. His face is being swelled up. He's all sweaty. He's bruised and battered. He's tired. He's exhausted. And in one of the rounds before the end, he takes a final swing and he knocks his opponent right in the face and knocks him out. The guy hits the mat. He becomes victorious. He becomes a conqueror. He wins that battle. And in that moment, he wins $10 million. Do you know who else gets that $10 million? His wife and his kids. They didn't have to fight the battle, but they get the rewards of the battle. They are hyper Nikeo. They are more than conquerors, which means Jesus stepped in the ring we were supposed to be in. Jesus stepped in because we sinned, and he said, I will fight on your behalf. I will take the bruises. I will be whipped for your case. I will take the crown of thorns on my head, and I will be pierced on a cross, and I will win the fight. And they thought they won. Satan thought he won. But three days later, Jesus took one final blow, and he knocked out death. He knocked out Satan. He knocked out the finished work, and all victory, and all heaven and listen, eternal life and everything God has to offer is the reward that we get because Jesus fought the battle. He fought the battle. We get the rewards of it. We just got to make him king. Man, that's a good gospel. The bad news is we sin. The good news, Jesus paid for it. But let's not miss this point. We got to go here. It says, and why? Because of love. For God so loved the world, he gave his son to die upon that cross. And what what people do sometimes, and I've done this, is they look at this scripture and they see the statement that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and that is true. Nothing can. He loves us fiercely. But we can reject that love. And there's a lot of people I love who are separated me from right now who I still love, but they're making choices that I can't condone with. Man, there's people I love who are in prison right now or who are on parole because of the choices they make. Pray for them, and I love them tremendously. I still want God to continue to work in their life. Man, I was someone that was loved when I ran away from the church and I ran away from the faith that was built up and I ran from my life and people just, they loved me, but I was separated from them. Listen, we have to understand that, yes, nothing can separate us from the love of God. But the sobering truth is, is we have to also understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God and nothing will also separate us from the judgment of God. And I know we don't like to talk about that in 2024, but that's the gospel. Because without Jesus, we would all be judged. But Jesus took the payments because he is a just king. 
He's a humble king. He laid his life down for us. He's a victorious king. We are more than conquerors through Christ, but he's also a just king. See, a lot of people that say, Sean, stick with the love stuff. You can't have love without justice. Deep down, we all want justice. Deep down, we all want to see people do right. You see, this is exactly what happened. Because we sinned against the holy God, we could not be in communion with him anymore. And that broke God's heart. And he wanted to restore that. And so there was a crime. It was our sin. And it needed to be paid in full. And the only way for that to happen, Romans says, is because the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. That's our death. That's what we should have to go through. And so God had to be just because he is holy. And he sent his son down into this life to walk among us, to be perfect and become the sacrifice for our sin. So when Jesus was on that cross, it says he became sin, our sin. And the wrath of God that we deserve rightfully, he poured out on his son on that cross. And Jesus says, why have you abandoned me? His own father abandoned him because he became sin. But listen, the reason why God abandoned his son is because when us as sons and daughters make a decision to follow Christ, he will never abandon us. He was a just God because someone had to pay for it. So the cross is God's love, but the cross is also God's justice. And we can receive that finished work or we can reject it. And we find out that at the end of the life, we're gonna have to, make an account for what that looks like. But man, our king is just. Jesus is a rightful judge. On his last breath in John 19, this is what he said, it is finished. Jesus, his last breath, is he's taking out the wrath of God. I'm, I'm, the cross hurt, but the wrath of God, I'm sure, hurt way worse. And when he went to let out his last breath, he said this word in the Greek, it is finished to tell us die. And this word is so powerful, it means it is finished, it is completed in a business context. This means in that time, they had ancient, man, uh, ancient receipts. When someone owed a debt, when it was paid in full, they would get a receipt that says, it is finished, to tetelestai. In a judicial context, when someone had a sentence that they had to be tried for, they had to fulfill that sentence until it was completed. When it was completed, they got papers saying, it is finished, it's been fulfilled, the sentence has been cleared, to tetelestai. In a military context, when they would go out to war and battle, what they would do is they'd go out to fight, and they would have victory, and they'd be victor victorious over that battle, and they would get the plunder and everything from it. And when they came back with victory, they would say, it is finished, the war is over, to die. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, it is finished, what he is saying to you and I is, hey, that debt that we owe because of our sin, it's been paid in full. That sentence that we deserve because of our sin, it's been fully served. And that battle that we could have never fought on our own, it's been fully completed. I am victorious and I've done this for you. It is, it's finished. It's been finished for us. I, I don't know how to convince people, and I can't because it's not by my power, that Jesus did all of this for us. And just says, just accept it. Just, just accept it. I, I know it's easy to want to live for ourselves, but he's a good king. He laid his life down. And he says, listen, our sin separates us from God, but I made a way back to God. I built a bridge. You can come in relationship with God again. Just put, believe that Jesus did it. Just receive my love. Receive my grace. See, we got to understand that the love, we can't be separated from it. But at the end of our life, we will be judged on basis of according on the decision we make here. That's why Paul tells his protege, Timothy, a young guy in the faith, pastoring at a church. He's encouraging Timothy how to pastor his church. And he says this. He goes, I urge you, Timothy, in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. And he continues on to tell Timothy how to preach the scripture and, and pastor his church. Y'all, these words are said to me as a pastor. These words are said to us, that we have to remind ourselves that every time we speak, that we talk about God's love, we talk about grace, but we gotta remind people that Jesus will someday judge the living and the dead. Who's the living? Those who made Jesus king and put their faith in the finished work of Christ, to tell us die. He rose from the grave, it is empty. He gives you new life in Christ. And you are in relationship with God. Who's the dead? Those who are still being tried for their sins because they have not believed in the finished work of Christ. It's already been paid for. You just got to receive the gift. So he says someday we are all going to meet him face to face. He is King Jesus, whether we believe it or not. 
when I was in high school, me and my older brother, he's 13 months older than me, my parents went out of town and my, they said we could have a couple friends over. And so about midnight that night, we had about 40 people at the house. It's a couple. We were making decisions we shouldn't do. Students do not get any ideas. And uh, just making a decision we were supposed to be making. And at this party, we decided to get a fog machine out. I don't know where it came from, but we started filling up the house with fog. And every square inch of our house was completely full of fog. The bathrooms, the bedrooms, everything. You could not see like a half inch in front of you. And in the middle of this, people decided to be fun to play dodgeball with toilet paper rolls and things were breaking. I was getting hit in the face with stuff. Like it was just out of control. People were making decisions that were causing more harm than good. And so here we are doing this. And I remind myself that my parents are gonna be back early morning. And so about five in the morning gets around. We still can't see anything. And the sun's coming up. And we say, open up the windows. We gotta air this thing out. As we open up the windows, fog is billowing out of our windows. I mean, I'm so glad that no one called the firefighters because it looked like our house was on fire. We kicked people out of the house besides just a couple of friends. We cleaned up everything, made sure everything was in order because we wanted to make sure that no one knew. My parents came home and my dad and mom walked in. They said, hey, what's going on, guys? Like, oh, nothing. Just praying. (laughs) Worshiping. No, we were not. Uh, And we were talking with them, and everything seemed good. And we're like, yes, we got away with it. And sure enough, my mom was in the other room, and all of a sudden I hear her say something from the other room. She goes, what in the world is all over the mirror and counter? I was like, I I don't know. Sure enough, we found out that the fog machine we were using was an oil-based fog machine. It left a film all over our house. You just, like, draw on it. It's like, you are dead, right? Like that. <laughs> and in that moment, we had to sit down and we had to talk to dad. We had to talk to Wade Jensen, y'all. And he's a good father, and, and I love him, and I'm so thankful for him, and I didn't ever want to disappoint him, but he, he was on business. He stood on business. And when I talked with him, he said, hey, what's going on? We told him, and we were grounded. We were punished in that moment. He's a great father. So thankful. You know why there's a lot of decisions I made that I'm not proud of in high school, but there was a lot of decisions I chose not to make because I knew at the end of it, I would have to talk to dad. I would have to talk to him and process that. And I didn't want to disappoint him. And, and so I had this healthy fear of knowing that at the end of the time, I'm going to have to have this moment with dad. And I think when I share things like this, that we forget that in these moments and in these spaces, I share all these things. God's given us instruction. He's made a way for us. And we have people that said, nah, I'm good. I'm gonna live my life. I wanna be ruler of my life. I don't need a king. I'm good. And we live our whole life and we think we're gonna get away with it. And at the end, we forget that at the end of our life, we are all gonna have to talk with dad. We're all gonna have to meet with God. And he's gonna say, did you, did you accept my free gift of grace? Did you see what my son did for you? Did you see that he laid his life down for you even when you were broken and hurting and you were fall off? Did you receive that grace? And he, I did. He goes, welcome in, son. Welcome in, daughter. I'm so glad that you're here. But some people are going to say, I heard about it, but I, I didn't think it was serious. And his heart's broken. And even though he still loves him and nothing can separate, he goes, you're going to have to depart from me because I never knew you. He doesn't say that because he doesn't love them. He says that because he gave all of us a choice. And we can either accept it or not because scripture says that when it comes to Jesus, every knee will bow, every knee, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So here's the thing we have to understand. We can see Jesus as king right now and voluntarily bow, or we can reject Jesus as king and mandatorily bow when we meet him face to face. I would encourage you that you do it voluntarily because all of us are going to bow someday. And I'm telling you, it's the best decision I've ever made in my life when I turn 19 to say, I'm so tired of ruling my own life. I make a lousy ruler. King Jesus, you're in control. I never, I don't get it right all the time. I still trip up. I still fall. But man, King Jesus has been there through it all. He paid for my sin. He paid for my transgressions and he paid for yours too. And he has made a way back to his father. He can be your king today too. How, Sean? You just gotta confess in the finished work. He said it's finished and he's, that tomb is empty. You just gotta say, I'm a, I'm a sinner. Jesus, you're a savior and I'm repenting for my sin. That word, this means I'm turning away from it and I'm heading a different direction. Today you get to make a 180. Let's pray. 
If you're here and you want to make that 180, you say, man, this is it. Jesus paid it all for me. I'm going to choose him right now. I'm going to voluntarily bow right now that he's my king. I want you to pray this prayer between you and God. I mean it. Don't worry about the people next to you. You're not going to have to give an account to them at the end of life. It's between you and God. I just want you to look at him and say, God, thank you for sending in your son, Jesus. Thank you for loving me so much that you sent him to die in my place. I don't deserve that because I'm a sinner and I need you as my savior. Thank you for finishing the work of the cross and the grave so I could not just be set free, but I could be a new person in Christ. I want victory today. I want you as my king. I put my faith in you and my trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. See, we've had people make that decision all weekend, and maybe, just maybe, you made that decision, and Scripture's very evident that if you did, all of heaven's rejoicing. The king is throwing a party on your behalf, and right now, we want to party with you. And so what I'm going to ask you to do something very courageous, but it's going to be It's going to be super simple, and we're not going to embarrass you. We want to celebrate you. So at the count of three, I'm going to say, if you pray that prayer, I want you to throw your hand up. And this isn't so we can point our finger at you. This is so we can celebrate all that God is doing in your life. And one of our ushers is going to bring you a resource that's going to help you with your new step in Christ. That's going to help give you the tools that you need to see what it's like to follow and fulfill the walk that Jesus has for you. So with just the two seconds of courage, I believe God can do a powerful thing in your life. So if that's you at the count of three, just that was me. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he dies again. Three, you say, that was me. From the top to the back, to the lobby, to online, if that was you, just throw your hand up high. I see you. They're coming right now. Throw your hand up high if that's you in this place. Anybody else? I see you. Hey, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I see you right there. Come on, church. Let's let them know they're at the family of God all over the place. Oh, man, every weekend, it is so exciting and encouraging to see more people taking their next steps in their faith journey. And here at Vail, we believe that everybody has a next step in their journey. So the question is, what's yours? We've seen all weekend people taking the next step of following Jesus for the first time, and it has been incredible. But maybe you've already taken that step, and your next step is to get baptized or to join a small group, or to start serving here at Vail in some capacity. Whatever your next step is, we want to know about it so that we can celebrate it and we can partner with you because we believe that nobody goes on this journey alone. And so if you're ready to take a next step, I want to invite you to text the word NEXT to the number on the screen or fill out the next step card from the seat in front of you and drop that off at the info counter so that we can celebrate with you and talk about how we want to partner in this journey. Now, if you're visiting with us today, you already took a next step just by showing up. And we are so glad that you are here with us this weekend. Again, I want to invite you to text the word next to the number or fill out the next step card, check the new here box, and bring that out to the info counter. Because when you do that, not only will we be able to just reach out and, and connect with you this week, But when you're new and you're visiting with us and you text that number or turn that card in, we're also going to make a one-time donation to a local ministry partner in your honor just because you showed up. Now, the reason we do that is we believe that we are wired for generosity. We believe that giving is something that God wants for you and not from you. And so if you would like to participate in giving here at Vail and partner with us in all that God is doing in and through his church, there are several ways that you can do that. If you brought cash or check donations, you can put those in any of our drop boxes located on the walls at both exits or out in the lobby. But you also can get digitally by going to our website, veil.church. You can text the word Veil to 77977, or you can give using the free Veil Church app. Now, as we get ready to get out of here today, I want to remind you of a few things. Number one, you are invited to come back next week as we start our new series that we are so excited about. We believe that God's going to do some incredible things through this. And so we are excited to have you come back at one of our normal service times on Saturday at 4 or Sunday at 9 or 11. And we are excited to see you back next week. As we get out of here in just a few seconds, we're going to keep this room a little quieter and a little bit more down. So if you would like to reflect on today's message, you can do that. But also, if you would like to take communion, we've got that available up here on the stage. And if you would like prayer for anything, members of our prayer team are down here ready to meet you. We are so glad that you are here with us today. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Happy Easter. We look forward to seeing you back next week.